Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Okay, if we could please come to order. It's 9 o'clock. This is the April 6, 2020 meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Um, I'm Chair Amy Scott Gailey. Physically present this morning, we have Vice Chair Steve Carter and Commissioner Bill Lashley. Present on the phone calling in, we have Commissioner Tim Sutton. Commissioner Sutton, can you hear me? Present. And we also have Commissioner Eddie Boswell. Commissioner Boswell, can you hear me? I sure can. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, obviously, as we all know, that this is the time of the coronavirus that has given us significant challenges to um, our community in just about every way that we can imagine. And um, as the governing board, we are meeting today to conduct essential business of this county. Um, Commissioner Sutton and Commissioner Boswell volunteered to call in. We are going to do things a little differently today. We are spread out around the room. Um, we are limited to 10 people being physically present so that we are in compliance with the governor's order, executive order, limiting gatherings to no more than 10 people. Um, during the course of the meeting, we may have a person leave and another person come in to attend to our essential business. Other than myself and our other two commissioners physically present here today, are our clerk, Tori Frank, our county attorney, Claude Albright, our county manager, Brian Haygood, our sheriff, Terry Johnson, our um, health director, Stacy Saunders, and our finance director, Susan Evans. So thank you all for attending today. Um, I'll also say that um, as we get into today's agenda, that we're not going to have a public comment period. The law requires us to have one public comment period per month. It's the custom of this board to have two, one at each monthly meeting. Um, since the law doesn't require one today, we're going to postpone that one or cancel it for today and then have it next um, meeting. We're doing things differently today. We are live streaming this meeting. We're having commissioners call in. I said, if you're gonna make a cake and you never made one before, you don't start with a wedding cake. You start with something a little more simple. So today we're starting with the simple things that we are required by law to do. And as we um, get some expertise, we'll build out from there. So uh, all that being said, uh, I will start this meeting with an invocation. Um, if you are not a person of prayer, you do not feel compelled to join us. But uh, if you are a person of prayer, Please feel free to join us in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts to you with praise and thanksgiving for the beautiful day that you've given to us. Lord, our community is struggling. Our community is, in many cases, suffering. Our community is, is hurting, Lord. There are people who have fear for their livelihoods, for their physical well-being, their safety, their health, the health of their loved ones. Lord, our um, economy has just been decimated by this virus, um, but you are the God of goodness. You can heal, you can guide us, direct us. Lord, we just seek your presence today. I seek your peace and your healing for the people who are suffering, Lord, that um, we would remember that ultimately we turn to you for our hope and not to structures or dollars or um, other things of this world, Lord, we look to you to be the source of our peace and our healing. I pray that your hand of blessing would be on this governing board and on our General Assembly, our governor, our Congress, our president, as our country negotiates this very difficult time. I pray that you would give us your supernatural guidance, your wisdom, your patience, and Lord, that ultimately you would heal this land and that you would
bless all those who have risked themselves personally for the betterment of their community. All of our first responders, whether it's DSS or the EMS, our Sheriff's Department, our Health Department, um, all of those who are working so hard to um, keep people safe and to bring healing to this land, especially our doctors and nurses and the people in our healthcare system, Lord. I pray that each step we take would bring us closer to you, that our thoughts, our words, our actions would be pleasing in your sight, and that you would um, guide us, Lord, and make us worthy of the callings that you have put before us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. If you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic, Okay, next is uh, approval of the agenda. If there are no questions or concerns about the agenda, if we could have a motion for approval. Motion to approve. We have Commissioner Carter has made a motion to approve and Commissioner Lashley has seconded. If there are no questions, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right, next we have just a few items on our consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you, Mr. Carter and Mr. Lashley. We have a motion and a second to approve the items on the consent agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Okay, the first presentation for business that we have is a COVID-19 update from Stacy Saunders, our public health director. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning on the phone. Good so morning. I always like to start with a little bit of the background. Um, not that you might need a reminder, but um, but COVID-19 is a novel coronavirus um, that is displaying and demonstrating uh, respiratory system, uh, symptoms like fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, and some other flu-like types of symptoms with chills, uh, fatigue, those types of things. First identified in China in December of 2019. Um, the first known case here in the U.S. was um, January 21st, and the first known case in North Carolina was March 3rd. We first confirmed um, a case here in Alamance County on March 20th. And um, as far as the case counts in the U.S., the totals this morning uh, were over 337,000. Um, in North Carolina, as of yesterday's update, uh, we had um, 2,585. The update for that will come around 11 o'clock today. Um, and in Alamance County, we currently have 19 cases. So within our county, um, of those 19 cases, 12 of them have recovered, which means um, that they are out of isolation and um, are doing well. Of the active cases that we still have remaining in our county, three of them are um, getting care through the hospital system right now. We've had no deaths in Alamance County. In North Carolina, of those um, 2,585, um, 261 are hospitalized, and there are 31 deaths as of yesterday um, in North Carolina. Globally, um, it's over a million cases at this point, confirmed cases, um, and I believe it's somewhere around 57,000 um, deaths globally. Within, in, within North Carolina, 79% um, of those cases are, are, those confirmed cases are in folks who are less than 65 years old. However, 84% of the deaths are in folks who are 65 years and older. So we're seeing um, wider distribution of the, the confirmed cases uh, with most of the folks being under um, 65 years. But when it comes to the deaths, an overwhelming amount um, are still in that group that is 65 years and older. As of yesterday, 89 uh, counties in North Carolina have been reporting at least one or more cases. Um, so we have almost the entire um, state 
having experienced at least one case at this point. Um, as of Friday, because I, I wasn't at the office this morning, um, the health department has reviewed over 430 test results, all, all those test results, um, 19 of them being positive. Those are the positive cases that you hear about, which means um, about 413 have been negative so far. That's just the test results that we get in. So state law uh, requires that you shall, you must, report a positive to the health department, um, but you don't necessarily have to report all your negatives. The state is trying to get more folks to, um, more providers and testing sites to report all the negatives so that we get a good idea of who's being tested, but we're not quite there yet. So um, in Alamance County, that's 430 total that we've been reviewing um, since about March 17th. And um, most of them have been negative. I just also wanted to add that the Alamance County COVID call center, um, that general call center has received over um, 1,130 calls so far. Of those, um, 355 have been transferred to the nurse bank that's over at the Alamance County Health Department. Um, other interesting facts that um, the state is keeping up with, um, which reflects the current percentage of hospitals that are reporting, but there are a total of um, 14,766 total inpatient beds um, in North Carolina based on the percent of hospitals who have been reporting. Um, and 6,418 of those are empty currently as of yesterday. Um, 300, I'm sorry, 3,223 um, ICU beds total for the hospitals that are reporting. And as of yesterday, 732 are empty. Hmm. That, that changes daily based on which hospitals are reporting. Um, I just wanted to go through, I know folks are interested in sort of what's been happening both statewide and locally, um, and the strategies statewide really are coming from uh, both the governor's office and DHHS. So you've had several executive orders that have come through um, in the last couple of weeks, starting um, with Executive Order 117, which did uh, call for the closure of K through 12 schools and uh, initially called for the um, canceling of mass gatherings that had over 50 folks in them. And then from there, we had Executive Order 118 that limited restaurants and bars and their operations. Um, Executive Order 119 expanded access to child care. Um, Executive Order 120 uh, had restrictions for long-term care facilities, um, additional restrictions for some businesses, and dropped that mass gathering to 10. And Executive 121 uh, was the stay-at-home order uh, for 30 days, which we are currently in. Um, and we also saw an Executive Order 122 around state surplus and Executive Order 124, um, which prohibited utilities from disconnecting services for folks um, during this for 60 days. So the point of the stay-at-home order was to limit the exposure to others, because um, at this point with community transmission, not only in our state, but in the country, we can assume that any person you come in contact with could be an exposure site. Um, and the general precautions are still in place, meaning wash your hands, sanitize when you don't have soap and water, um, avoid sick people. If you're sick, stay at home. You should be staying home anyway, unless there's essential business to be happening. Um, keep your distance when you are out and about for those necessary outings. Um, and making sure that distance is at least six feet. Um, and then uh, recently the CDC had some guidance around um, general public and wearing masks uh, when that six feet can't be achieved. We're still learning more about that guidance um, and what we can do about that locally. And so that guidance has changed over time too, um, to now that guidance has a real big focus on high risk and high priority groups. So in the beginning, um, when we were still in sort of a containment period, uh, there was a big push to test um, just about everybody we could. That changed over both nationally and statewide um, to really focusing on high risk and high priority groups. And those high risk groups are the same ones you've heard me talk about before, the over 65 underlying health conditions, weakened immune system, um, pregnant women and, um, and young infants um, are making their way onto that list. And then that high priority group um, are the folks who might be living in a long-term care facility, might be healthcare workers, uh, first responders, uh, public health, um, law enforcement, EMS, fire departments, 
and that um, if exposed and they show symptoms, we definitely want those folks to be tested. And so that's that high priority group now. So that guidance has changed a little bit. Now locally, um, the health department, and I won't go into the community wide one, um, I'll let um, County Manager Haygood cover that. But for the health department, our objectives first and foremost are to identify those cases. Um, that is our job all day long, to identify those cases, um, continue to do contact tracing for the close contacts of the cases that we get. And if um, once a case is identified, um, it's isolated at the time, uh, at, that t at the time of the testing. So the provider or the hospital or whoever is doing the testing at that time, um, the individual is sent home to isolate immediately because they are presumed to be positive at that point. Um, once the test comes back and it is positive, they stay in isolation um, at that point. The household and the close contacts are then uh, contacted by us. Um, and um, if they are asymptomatic, they are put in quarantine. So quarantine is for asymptomatic um, for 14 days post the last exposure to the case. So if the case's illness goes on for seven days and it's a household contact, um, if I live in a household with a, with a positive case, my 14 days starts the last day the case was um, symptomatic <clears throat> or was infectious. So it might be longer than 14 days depending on how long their illness is and how much my contact is. But if I just, um, if I just saw somebody randomly um, and we, I became a close contact, but I went back to my house and um, never saw, never got exposed to the case again, my 14 days starts at the last exposure. Oh, but it's at least 14 days. I hope that makes sense. Um, if the close contact becomes symptomatic, then they become a person under investigation for us, which means, okay, so they were a close contact, but now they're symptomatic. They are presumed at that point to be positive until their test comes back and tells us that it's negative, and they are isolated at that point because they're symptomatic. And we start working up their close contacts, which should be pretty close to none, unless it's a household. Um, we have, typically, we only have one communicable disease nurse full-time um, that is working on this um, in, the, in the normal periods of time. Um, we also have a communicable disease um, supervisor who gets pulled in into um, situations like this, and we pull two other nurses. So now we have a team of four communicable disease nurses who are working up all of that that I just told you about. And then in addition to that, um, the health department is housing that nurse phone bank. So those calls that are medical or healthcare in nature that come to the general call center come to us. And we have um, anywhere from two to four nurses who are running that phone bank. So we pulled them out of other areas to run that phone bank. And they're triaging the medical and healthcare related COVID calls. Um, we do have sometimes two um, retired nurses who used to be um, on our staff who have come back to help because uh, we also still have to have our nurses doing other work. So we're trying to pull as much as we, resources as we can. Um, in addition to that, we've started the long-term care facility task force. Uh, one of the greatest concerns that I have and um, that we have at the health department is um, having an outbreak in one of our uh, long-term care facilities where um, those high-risk uh, groups are congreg congregating and living together. And so we're proactively reaching out to long-term care facilities. We did this um, a couple weeks ago with a memo from the health director's desk around restricting uh, visitation and we've built that task force um, to be a bit more robust now. Um, and we um, have a team of um, nurses and registered environmental health specialists who are gonna be contacting the long-term care facilities in our community and have been, um, but in a more um, intense sort of way to go over protocols, um, what protocols they have in place, what screenings and what surveillance they currently are doing. Um, we'll be providing technical assistance for all of the screening and the surveillance. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Do, does the health department screen the uh, retirement uh, properties people or so we're working with the long-term care facilities okay. to do that now um, 
So they really do it on their own? And That's right. And we want them to start looking for any symptoms okay. and um, any signs and symptoms um, to make sure that their protocols are in place. So if they see someone who has symptoms, even without a case on their property, we want, we want to know about it so that we can help um, them uh, put protocols in place that help protect everybody, that everybody else that's there. Um, we're also assessing the ability of long-term care facilities to collect specimen. So remember when I talked about those high priority groups, this is one of them. Um, and so if we had someone who was symptomatic in a long-term care facility, we want them tested um, and to know if it's really COVID or if it's flu or something else yeah. um, so that we can protect the rest of the folks who are living there and, and the workers, like the healthcare workers um, are high priority as well in this situation. Um, and so we're assessing their ability to collect and whether um, they can collect on their own with their own staff or if they can collect, do they have the supplies? Um, and if they don't, can the health department help them get supplies? Um, or do they have capacity um, limitations that require the health department to help more um, robustly? And like I said, that's a team of nurses and environmental health specialists. Um, we are continuing our daily messaging to the public. We're doing technical assistance to businesses, governments, uh, partners, community partners, child care centers, the school system. Um, we have an active role in the EOC um, and the EOC task force, including the child care and house housing task force. And um, Brian can go over more of that if you're interested. So that's your update for today. Um, I have a question. Yeah. You shared a, a, uh, a graph with us, a timeline graph that showed the curve for the growth in hospitalizations mm -hmm. of, from COVID. Um, has that graph flattened any with the implementation of the emergency uh, ordinance and the implementation of stay at home and the closing of restaurants, closing other facilities? Has that flattened that graph significantly for North Carolina? I think you're referring to the projections, right. is that right? Um, and not the DHHS website right. one. Um, the projections, if you're looking at the one um, that Dr. Burks used, uh, which is IHME, that changes daily based on the data that's available, um, the real-time right. data. And um, you'll see it fluctuate a little bit because um, it is accounting for any strategies like stay-at-home orders um, and any other community level strategies. Right. And that I have seen, and that peak has changed for North Carolina. It was around April 25th. The last time I checked, it's April 27th. So you're starting to, it's starting to scooch out. Um, I haven't seen a huge dampening of that curve yet, but it's, but it's a little too soon probably because we're gonna see the biggest impact of some of that stay at home order, not in the current incubation period because we would have already been right. exposed to folks, but it's in the, um, once the order went in place, that incubation period, okay. when okay. we have limited our exposure, that we'll hope to see the lessening. Okay. I'm keeping an eye on that same projection to see if that, if we're seeing that come down, because okay. it's based on real-time data um, all over the U.S., but also from our own counts. You can specifically look at North Carolina's on that one. Okay. Stacy, okay. I read somewhere that 70% of the people who, who died from this virus was in, had died to diabetes. Is that true? I haven't seen that statistic. I know that folks who have underlying conditions, including diabetes, uh -huh. are at risk for severe illness. I've not seen a specific statistic uh, with percentage. it. But we are, diabetes is one of those that's listed as a yeah. um, higher risk for severe illness. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, obesity is one of them, uh -huh. um, and a weakened immune system. And even um, lung disorders like asthma. So yeah. folks who have asthma, uh, we would be really concerned about them too. But I'll see if I can find out for you Thanks. if that's coming from a, um, a source. On the- uh... Stacy, this, Stacy, this is Eddie. Good morning. Uh, I've got a question. Good morning to you, ma'am. Good, good to hear you. Wish we could be there, but uh, we're not. So, <laughs> anyhow, uh, got a question about the personal protective equipment. You know, we've heard so much about that on the international, the national news, and everywhere. Are we prepared for that? For the ones that are on the front line? addressing this, our health care workers, our EMTs, and so forth? That's a great question, and I can answer that on 
from a perspective of the health department, I don't see the inventory numbers of our um, first responders or law enforcement or our health care providers. But I can tell you at the health department, um, we do have right now um, a good supply of N95s that will last us for a little while. And we're on a back order for additional ones. Um, we're also testing some folks um, to see if they can use a different N95 uh, because the ones that we use, that's that, respir that special mask that's called a respirator. We have about, mm -hmm. uh, we have two model numbers that we use the most um, at the health department. And of those two model numbers, they're the ones who are on back order. <laughs> so we're gonna try to see if folks can also get fitted for a different kind that's more readily available. Um, as backup. We also have quite a few surgical masks um, at the health department um, and we were able to help out a law enforcement partner um, with getting surgical masks as well. Um, those aren't the most effective um, for healthcare workers uh, but it does provide some layer of additional precaution. Um, we have a limited number of face shields. Uh, we have several goggles uh, and full supply of goggles at this point and gowns. Um, sanitizer tends to be one of the things that we are having trouble getting as well. Um, so we're urging our staff to really go out there, go and wash their hands as much as possible and try to conserve um, the sanitizer that we have. Um, and then the disinfecting wipes, uh, we're trying to get our hands on a few more of those as well. And then the collection kits for us, um, we have a limited number of state lab ones right now, um, five and LabCorp we have seven, but we've asked for another shipment of state lab ones um, to put us closer to um, 20 or so. And I think, the, okay. I don't have good numbers, I don't have any numbers uh, for the healthcare system, but I know that um, a few weeks ago, Cone Health did release their memo um, as to why they were shutting down their alternative testing or collection sites, those drive-through sites, and one of the reasons that they cited was to preserve their own um, PPE and valuable resources that would be needed in the um, hospital setting. But I don't have exact numbers for them. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, Mr. Boswell and Mr. Sutton, if you would mute your phones when you're not talking, then it helps. We're getting a little bit of feedback here. Um, it helps if you mute your phone when you're not talking. Mr. Sutton, did you have any questions? Yes, uh, forgive me. That may, may, excuse me, it may have been my uh, lack of the uh, using the button, but I was told I didn't need to. Um, I will now. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Uh, let me just start at the top. Uh, is there anything that Washington, Raleigh, or even at the local level, that would be put out there, i.e. an executive order, or that would cease the procedures as far as quarantine and so forth and so on? Cease the, which procedures? The stay at home order? Yes, well, you know, we talk about quarantine and so forth and so on, you know, a year from now or six months from now. Uh, would that be uh, a finite uh, procedure? Uh, or, or excuse me, infinite uh, procedure or would something that Washington would put out there or Raleigh would put out there and or the local level to where, you know, if somebody was tested, like in the past, some of the other uh, communicable diseases, that you wouldn't have to go through what we're going through right now as, as a treatment or, or, or a procedure. In other words, is there anything that would happen at any level that would cause the uh, processes to to cease and or be lessened. Okay, um, I think I understand. So um, currently the executive order is for the next 30 days. So unless the governor lifts that or changes that, that's, that's what it is at this point. But I think I under, understand your question to be, is there something that could happen that would change our course? And I could say theoretically, um, a vaccine would might, a vaccine could potentially change your course. Um, and so we don't have that currently. And so the best measures that we have right now are the, are the staying at home um, and quarantining yourself and only going out for the necessary outings or essential business um, in order to lower your exposure to others. And then using the precautions because in the absence of a vaccine, that is your best, those are your best strategies. Um, and so 
and I know that they're working very hard on um, trying to find a vaccine. I don't know a, a good timeline to tell you when that will occur. I know folks are working on it, um, but I would imagine that if a vaccine were to be discovered and to be um, deemed appropriate for widespread use, that would change the, the course of your strategies, that there would be an added layer of protection there that we didn't have before. But currently, you're your limiting of exposures and your precautions, your general precautions are the only strategies that you have um, to make sure that folks um, don't come in contact with someone who may be um, infected with the virus. Okay, I understand that, that's obvious. Uh, my, my question is, for instance, right now, we're quarantining people. We're getting in touch with people they've been in touch with and so forth and so on. I understand that, and I support that 100%. But would if if we get to a level to where a certain level, would that process cease or lessen, uh, and, and it just be as in the past where we treat things and uh, people aren't quarantined or people don't have to tell everybody tell who all they've been in touch with? I mean, I I'm trying to make it as clear as I can. I got but, you. Uh, so would we ever stop contact tracing at a local level? Um, and so I can tell you that um, contact tracing looks different depending on where you are. That in cities where um, we have, um, you know, extremely large numbers compared to our 19, they may not be doing contact tracing the same way we are um, here in Alamance. Our numbers are still very manageable. And so we are doing sort of a hybrid of mitigation and still doing containment because we want folks who who are potentially, who do have the virus to stay at home, and that folks who were in close contact and more likely to um, con you know, actually develop illness, we want them to stay away from other people. That's how this health department is handling that right now, because those numbers are still, uh, we can still easily manage that um, with pulling nurses from other areas to manage that contact tracing. So we're still doing a hybrid of containment and mitigation here. If you're in a very large city, whose numbers are quite larger than ours, your contract tracing may look different, but the, the still the guidance would be to stay at home while you're sick. Um, and if you've been exposed or think you've been exposed or presumed um, to be exposed, they're still gonna want you to stay at home um, because you're more likely to pass that on to someone else. And unfortunately, more likely to pass it on to someone who's gonna have severe illness um, and have maybe the worst outcome, which will be death. And so um, depending on what community you're in, that contact tracing may look different, but the guidance is still gonna be the same. Um, it's just a matter of how intense the contact tracing will be. We're still doing pretty intensive contact tracing because we can, and it makes good public health sense to do that. Um, and we want to contain this virus as much as possible. Um, and that, that's our strategy locally. Okay, I won't belabor that any further. Let me ask one more uh, on this. Will you make the distinction between positive and confirmed? Yes. Um, so a case, a confirmed case, means that someone has tested positive on the COVID test. So that they got a positive result on a test and now they are a confirmed case that must be reported to the health department. Their close contacts would be called persons under uh, monitoring, which means they're asymptomatic, but they had an exposure to a confirmed positive case. So we want to check in on them and make sure they're asymptomatic and that they're staying put, saying as in their home as much in quarantine, they have to stay in their home um, so that they don't potentially infect anyone else. If a person under monitoring who is under quarantine shows symptoms, any symptoms um, that would meet case definition, we then change them to a person under investigation, which means they have symptoms um, and they've had a close contact with a positive case, and we would be presuming that they have COVID and would be looking for them to get a test. And we would presume them to be positive until that test came back and told <laughs> us that they were negative. If the test comes, and they go into strict isolation um, because they're presumed to be positive. If the test comes back and they are indeed positive, then they stay in isolation for the remainder of their illness. If the test comes back, 
they um, go back into, they come out of isolation, but still would remain in quarantine dep depending on when their last exposure to the positive case was, because you could show symptoms within that incubation period. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Got a question about the presumed cases. We don't see that on a report. So when we see a report, all we're seeing are those that have been those that have been de determined to have the disease, have recovered, or the total number that have been that had mm -hmm. COVID. Yes. We get a number for those who have recovered, but we don't have any number for the numbers of people who might have been exposed and are presumed. That might be an interesting number to include on a report. And we don't include that one because it's not confirmed until we get that test result right. back. Um, but you're so not going to test them until they have symptoms. That's right. So once they have symptoms, they would be tested. Do you have uh, any well, idea? Well, I can say that the the ideal would be that they would be tested. Their provider may not test them because they meet case definition. And if they're not at high risk or high priority, they may not test them. They right. may st stick with just the presumed and say, you've had enough exposure to this other person who was a positive case. You're fairly healthy otherwise. You're not in one of these high risk groups. You're not a high priority group. I'm just gonna keep you in presumed. So without a test result, I may not know that. So we've had 19 cases, I believe. <laughs> confirmed that, cases. Confirmed cases. So do we have a ballpark for how many are <coughs> presumed? No. No, no idea, because okay. It could be that we only know about the confirmed cases and the contact tracing that we've done. So if you were to call your doctor and maybe you were you were in contact with somebody from another county right. who was a case, I'm not gonna know about necessarily I'm not necessarily right. gonna know about you. But if you develop symptoms and call your doctor and they say, Oh, you say I was um, exposed to a, a confirmed case somewhere else, um, I now have symptoms, the provider may say, well, okay, well, you're not high risk, you're not high priority, we're going to just presume and I'm not going to test you. You will stay in your home for this amount of time and then I will check in on you and when your symptoms subside, we'll determine when you can come out of isolation. Without a confirmed test, we are not going to get notified about that. Absolutely. And so that's part of that changing of containment to mitigation too, that um, more presumed folks may be out there and we won't know a good number for that. And in that case, the provider's doing the check-in? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Mr. Lash? No, I'm, I'm clear. Mr. Sutton or Mr. Boswell, do you have any other questions? Not at this time. No, I don't have any. Thank you, Stacy. That was very clear what you brought across. You, you guys are doing a great job and we just uh, wish you the best over there. Thank you so much. You all do well. Yeah, we definitely echo that, that um, we're just amazed by how hard you and your staff have been working and what a great Thank job you. you've been doing. And I just wish that the people of Alamance County could see closer. I guess maybe I'm glad that they can't see closer because <laughs> that would mean that they'd have a swab up their nose. But that's true. Um, <laughs> we appreciate you and all that you all do. And definitely. Very, very yeah, grateful. Really Thank you all so much. Um, then, uh, Mr. Haygood, do you have anything to add to the COVID-19 update? I do. Uh, commissioners, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner Sutton, Commissioner Boswell. Uh, good morning. First of, all, is. first of all, just let me uh, thank county staff. Uh, you've heard uh, a lot of good pertinent information from Stacy this morning. And let me just tell you, we've got a lot of employees out there working in very stressful situations. Uh, I think of EMS, I think of our uh, folks on the front lines at DSS and the, and the health department and our court security staff. These folks are doing a fine job, working very hard in a very unsettling time. And I certainly appreciate everything that they're doing. I wanted to let you know kind of where we are with county departments. At this time, all Alamance County Emergency Service Departments are operating. That's our uh, Sheriff's Office and Detention Staff, CECOM, EMS, Fire Marshal, and Emergency Management. There have been some limitations to public access uh, to these departments, I think particularly to the Sheriff's Department. They are still offering many of the services that they normally offer, but it's been drawn down a little bit. And we do have uh, some county departments that are operating and are open today, open to both the public and out providing their services, but they do have some limitations. This includes our inspections department, county health and DSS, 
our landfill, the Register of Deeds Office, Cooperative Extension and Soil and Water, Planning Department, and County Parks. These parks are these departments are open, but are encouraging folks if they're coming to the office. They've all posted signage trying to encourage folks to call the staff that are inside first before they actually come in. If we can help them over the telephone or direct them to something on the website they're looking for, they're trying to limit their uh, contacts. But these departments are open and providing services. Many of these services are mandated and must continue uh, continue to be provided. We also have uh, all county support departments remain open at this time. These are our uh, IT department, human resources, finance and purchasing, county maintenance, our GIS department, county manager's office, county attorney's office, and our clerk. Uh, we continue to be open and support roles as long as we've got emergency services and line departments working. We need some level of representation in each one of these departments. <laughs> these folks are teleworking whenever it's possible and feasible and doing some uh, rotation too, but the departments are open and continue to provide support. And we have uh, a handful of departments, four uh, to be exact, that are closed to the public. Uh, this includes our tax department, the Board of Elections, Veteran Services, and the libraries. The staff continues to work. Uh, inside the departments, but they are closed uh, to the general public. A lot of these folks, and I shout out to our library in particular, are being called to serve in other places, particularly our call center, the COVID uh, call center. These staff, if they're uh, not needed in their departments, are going over and rotating uh, covering phones over at the EOC. I'll let the commissioners know also that our county maintenance department has dramatically stepped up cleaning efforts in all county buildings. Uh, we have tripled the amount of coverage we put out on uh, the court buildings and in each county building trying to keep common areas bathrooms doorknobs everything uh, we can uh, clean we uh, particularly nuked this room before this meeting to try to fog it make sure there was no uh, potential virus in here you probably saw the device we have in the hallway that uh, pulls uh, can pull very small particles out of the air um, we're doing this at the courts too you know our court system continues to operate but at a limited capacity, so we are uh, cleaning those courtrooms and the court areas uh, uh, heavily every day. And the County Maintenance Department has also been working with the Health Department and DSS to do some modifications to people's work areas to try to put a barrier between them and the visiting public to do everything we can to try to protect the public uh, and the staff. Do we have plenty of masks? We do. Uh, EMS uh, has a significant number of masks. They seem to be okay. And when I talked to Ray Vipperman end of last week, they were working with Cone Health to, uh, Cone can clean the N95 mask a couple of times, I think it's four or five times before they have to be uh, tossed. But uh, the masks are limited for most of our departments. I think the Sheriff's Office was working on trying to secure some additional N95s. This week. Yes, so we hope to get some in this week. Our emergency operations center is open. Uh, it's been open for several weeks and it is currently open seven days a week, 12 hours a day, EM staff mans that. Uh, keeping an eye on all the communications from the state and also prepared in the event anything else happens. Uh, you know, this is a time of year when we get uh, strange weather events, uh, big thunderstorms, downline, mainline winds. So Debbie's group is ready in the event some other uh, thing out uh, breaks out. We do two EOC conference calls per week where we have our partners call in over a conference call similar to our commissioners this morning where they get briefings from county staff. And we've also upfitted a backup CECOM call center at the Family Justice Center. So in the basement of Family Justice, we had a large conference room and we've upfitted it to be a backup CECOM center in the event we need to split up CECOM. Uh, and, uh, really, it's a, a, a safety measure to ensure that if someone is exposed in CECOM, we can move people out and get them in another area uh, set up, ready to go. And uh, our call center, the COVID call center that you heard uh, Stacy talk about, it's also open seven days a week, 12 hours a day. I'd like to give that number for all the folks uh, watching over live stream. The telephone number for the COVID call center is 336-290-0361. Hats off to that group. Uh, as Stacy mentioned, they've had well over a thousand calls uh, since March 16th and they're doing an awesome job getting uh, providing local information to folks. It's like calling your neighbor that knows what's going on when it comes to COVID at Alamance County and they can they've put a lot of people in touch with health resources as well as just answer general community questions it's been very very helpful uh we've we've also final uh, point Brian, yes sir can, can I stop you right there for one second yes sir I don't know what happened on my end but right during that when you 
Uh, yes, sir. Are you still there? You faded out a little bit. Yes, I'm right here at the phone, so I, I, we must have, be having a little connection issue. But uh, your the phone number you gave out, I lost you when you were giving it out. So. Okay, that that telephone number. This is the COVID call center in Alamance County. The number is three three six two nine zero zero three six one. I got it that time. Great. Well, encourage people to call if they have questions to do with health or other community related uh, uh, questions about COVID. Um, and the last point I would bring up is we've had a lot of logistic changes uh, throughout the course of COVID-19. We've been getting all kinds of new directives from the state and the federal government about employee, employee benefits. Uh, one of the biggest ones that just recently came down was a new FMLA ruling that allows uh, for employees if they have uh, they meet certain qualifications if they believe they may have been exposed to uh, COVID they're able to take time off and get uh, have received pay and it also is for child care you know we've got uh, uh, we're running two camps right now in conjunction with the cities of Graham and Burlington uh, camps for first responders and essential employees children who obviously are out of school for ages 5 to 12 they have nowhere to go most uh, child cares have been closed and the schools are uh, closed so we need those first responders and essential employees to come to work so we're using uh, county graham and burlington park staff to run these camps but uh, the new fmla rules allow for employees to take uh, uh, time off with pay but it's a reduced pay for child care uh, they they lose uh, one third of their pay if they take it off for child care um, and uh, the county does have the option to exempt uh, emergency service and uh, essential employees from this we have chosen at this time not to do that the law covers everyone unless the Board of Commissioners takes action uh, I would suggest that uh, we wait and see if we have an overwhelming number of emergency service and essential employees that want to take this leave if we do I could come back to you and talk to you about we may have a need to exempt people at this time we have not had that so uh, that seems to be working the way that the uh, federal government has planned it and finally I will just say that uh, I've, I've certainly appreciated the good working relationship with the health director with Stacy she has been great continues to be a good resource for us we contact her a lot to try to help departments make decisions about how to provide services and how to staff and she's been uh, extremely helpful as well as uh, our municipal staff we've uh, we have stayed in contact throughout this whole ordeal with city management and city leaders uh, and I know the chair has been uh, very much involved in this whole process and has been very close with the mayors around the county and that has made the communications really really uh, uh, clear and and efficient so I appreciate all that I'll be happy to try to answer any questions about from the county government's perspective I don't have a question but I did get a call over the weekend uh, the new property we acquired for the Cane Creek Park yes uh, there's an access road into that property uh, I don't believe it's been paved or anything a gravel road but we had blocked it with a log and I got a call that some people have come out there with the chainsaws, cut the log up so they can get their four wheelers in. Oh, so parks might want to be aware of that if they're not. All, they may have already spotted it, but uh, I will uh, be sure and let Brian and his and his folks know that. Thank you. I have to put a steel cable. I'm sorry, good sir. I have to put a steel cable. Indeed, yes. There. One more thing, Brian, just to mention for the public is that. Please call that number um, rather than call 911. 911 has an increase in phone calls. Mm -hmm. That's not the number to call for coronavirus information. If you have coronavirus symptoms and things like that, or you need help, certainly call 911. But call the hotline so that they're not answering questions when they really need to be doing 911 calls. That's just a general across the board. Just a quick reminder. That's a really good point. Um, 911 is for people having heart attacks car accidents, um, serious, serious life-threatening emergencies. If you think your neighbor's not doing what they're supposed to under the governor's executive order, that's not a life-threatening emergency. And if you have a question mm -hmm. about the executive order or its enforcement or anything like that, you can call that COVID call center 336-290-0361. And the person who answers the phone will take a note of your concern and um, that's the proper way to handle that. Indeed. And these are all 
local folks to local they're all you know all local people uh county employees we also have some city employees from city of burlington that uh have uh, helped fill out the ranks on the call center so it's been a uh, I, I will have to say as a as i did say uh it's been a real joint effort between city and county governments uh, to address this mr sutton do you have any questions or concerns about this stuff okay i need to hit my button <laughs> no i'm fine okay mr boswell do you have anything else no i'm good thank you everybody mr lashley good. you good i had one other additional comment to make a reference to something stacy referred to back to the governor's order for small businesses to close like restaurants and clubs bars and things of that nature um as people should be aware by now there's a pay i don't know the exact title for this particular portion of the act but the paycheck preservation act uh, 350 billion dollars has been assigned to that I talked with several bankers this weekend uh, about how that's progressing they really had several hurdles four big hurdles this last week trying to get that up and in operation if you if you qualify for that type of a loan small business you want to keep your employees paid the loan will cover your payroll and other operating expenses for that I think it's two and a half month period of time but you have to go to your bank. The banks that I talk to are not taking applications from anybody that doesn't already bank with them. Um, they said that because of the issues with SBA and structuring this loan so that the banks can actually process them properly, it's probably going to be Wednesday, midweek sometime, before they can actually pro start processing these loans appropriately. Some have been processed through some of the larger banks and then they've run into some hurdles, changes in interest rates and so forth, but it looks like they've leveled it out and hopefully by midweek you can make that application. But you'll have to go to your bank that you deal with currently. Don't try to go to a bank that you don't have an, an account relationship with. Yeah, they will pay that those fees back to the to the people who run the restaurants I, I, I will tell you that the application process is what I would consider from my banking experience somewhat onerous there's a, a heavy burden on the applicant to provide a lot of detailed information but you can get the money to cover you for your operating expenses not to not to rebuild a building not to add additional space to your facilities or so forth but your historical operating expenses and if you keep people employed during that period of time then the debt at the end of this process will be forgiven so it's a really good technique yeah, to, the to reduce the impact on the unemployment applicants that we're receiving calls on well, that our state right now is overwhelmed with our unemployment calls so it's a good a good alternative and a good way to try and yes, take care is. of our people good alternative that's out Steve. Yes. I, I've got a question. Let's see. On these applications, where could they possibly go get them or what do they need to do to get it? The the applications by midweek should be available on your bank's website or I believe on the SBA website. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. That's awesome insight. Um, all right. I uh, also want to say that when we started the meeting, I neglected to mention that Bruce Walker is here. He was <laughs> tucked on the other side of uh, Commissioner Carter. I didn't see him um, in the corner. And Must he be is. Must I take up a lot of space, right? <laughs> <laughs> he uh, is in charge of our um, IT department, and they have been doing just amazing work in helping us mm -hmm. to figure out how to set up stuff. You know. When uh, Mr. Haygood mentioned that we set up the CECOM uh, remote site, people don't realize all that stuff, the IT gets involved with that as well. All kind of things like that, projects and, and helping with the remote communication and things. So, sorry I skipped you over there. Um, we'll go forward. If there's no other, do you, um, Mr. Boswell, Mr. Sutton, do you have any concerns right now? You good with me? I don't. I'm fine. Okay, good. Then we'll move forward on our agenda to the next item, which is our budget retreat information.
Thank you, commissioners. Uh, you have the, folk, uh, the commissioners that are here present. You have several documents in front of you, and uh, Commissioner Sutton and Commissioner Boswell sent you an email with documentation attached. Uh, you have a copy of this PowerPoint. It's a hard copy here in front of you. I'll be going through this with you this morning. You also have a copy, uh, and this was in the email, uh, commissioners, of the snapshots. This is uh, a little more detail of all county departments and outside agencies. So this is detailed information. I'm not going to go over this document specifically, but it's all included in the retreat information that I'll be going over with you. Then you also have received by email and have a hard copy in front of you, copy of Alamance Brown School Systems request for fiscal year 2021. And you also have in the email and hard copy before you, uh, a copy of the community colleges uh, budget request for fiscal year 2021. The only thing you do not have at this time, and the only reason is because it's, it's just such a huge file, this is a copy of, the, of all the applications of outside agencies right that are not education we are going to what we're going to do is post this online and then send you a link to it it's just it was over 600 pages it's just too big of a file to email to you so at the end of this meeting we'll have this posted online and we'll send a link to you and you can check out all the uh, outside agency requests but I'm going to go over a summary of them uh, as I as I go through this retreat information each one of these slides commissioners Boswell and Commissioner Sutton are numbered so as I go through these I'll tell you the number of the slide that I'm on and then start going over information that's on that slide. And if at any time you have a question, uh, I'll, I'll try to kind of keep my ears peeled for the commissioners who are uh, on the phone and commissioners here today, just stop me as I go through it. But as you can imagine, uh, this has been a very interesting budget experience. We were knee well, well deep into budget uh, by the time COVID uh, kind of started, right? We, uh, first of March, we'd already received uh, requests from departments and outside agencies and we're starting to compile that we'd already conducted our meetings with departments we were already looking at uh, we've been looking at revenue projections for months and uh, what you're going to see here what I'm going to go over with you is what we were seeing what we've seen from the departments their requests and then the revenue information that I'll talk to you about is revenue projections and what we were seeing pre-COVID and the, our best thought about what that what COVID has done and what it might do to us. So uh, a lot of uncertainty in this with the exception of the budget request from the department. Make sure I'm on. There Quick we question, please. Yes, sir. Uh, why were, were the outside agencies, why, why were there so many pages and so forth and so on? Are we requesting more information for uh, from them? Never seen uh, anything close to that. Not even close, as far as what you alluded to. Yes, we we developed a uh, outside agency application form. I think it was maybe two years ago, and uh, it has multiple pages asking them to provide us financial information. And if I'm not mistaken, I think some of the groups are required to provide us with an audit. Uh, so all of that information is in this, and it, it's it's just a tremendous amount. Uh, it can be a little difficult to wade through, but I hope the slide in this presentation will help, at least help the commissioners get an idea of who's asking for funding from the county and, and, the, and the, the county dollars. Yes, good. Uh, one more question or a suggestion. May we have, Eddie and I have a uh, hard copy uh, of everything that the other three have hard copies of, please. Yes, sir. We, we, Thank you. Yes. So information uh, that will go over kind of where we are right now in the budget process. Understand this is a retreat. Normally we have all the department heads here and everybody would be prepared to speak to you about their requests if you had questions. What I'd like to do today is if you do have questions about any of this information that I can't answer because it may be related to a specific department, we'll, I'll note that question get with the department head later and send that answer to all of the commissioners. So uh, at this time, the total budget requests from all of county government, from our education uh, partners and outside agencies, the total request is $181,717,221. And I'm on, I'm on slide number two. So of that $181 million, $124 million of it pertains to county government. 
and you can kind of see how it breaks down under the county government piece. 100 million is for county services. That's really county departments. Uh, we, we budgeted the same amount for mental health. We're looking at the same dollar amount, the MOE money. We have our debt service and our transfer, which our transfer is our capital plan. And then we have a contingency. And then for education, the, the total education request at this time is a little over $53 million. And the total outside agency request at this time is over $3.7 million. So on slide number three, I'm trying to, I'll try to show you here how this total request stacks up against the 1920, this current fiscal year's adopted budget. So the current request from county government, outside agencies and education is the 181 million. Then for fiscal year 1920, the year that we're in right now, the current adopted general fund budget is $171.9 million. So that tells you that the, 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 uh, it's a total of a little over $9.8 million in increased requests. And how those requested increases break, break down, out that 9.8, 3.4 of it uh, is an re increase requested for our education folks. $925,000 is for the capital plan for education. Four point nine, almost $5 million of that $9.8 million increase is for county government. And outside agencies have asked for $446,000 in uh, increase. So I'm moving on to slide number four and going to talk about county government's requests, starting off with uh, requests from county departments that pertain to new personnel. So we have had a total request for 12 and a half positions, new positions for county government. And that includes three and a half positions in the general government category, as well as nine positions in public safety. And I'll go through those positions in a couple of slides that will give you some more details. And we have uh, one request from the library to take a part-time employee to full-time. And we have requests from four departments to institute a new career ladder. That would be tax, soil and water, parks, and the landfill. So to give you some more details about the uh, new position requests for general government, we have a request to institute a new position in the manager's office, office assistant four. This would be a person to work with our clerk to help with uh, organizing boards and committees, of which we have a significant number, as well as to help with uh, minutes and to help the office uh, with administrative duties. We also have a request for a new full-time employee in our GIS department. And this is uh, to help the department meet state requirements. Uh, the state is changing how 911 works. They're moving to next generation 911 and are uh, mandating that cities and counties uh, maintain a very high level of accuracy with street addresses. So we believe that would be a, a position worth considering. Also, we have a request for a new full-time position in our veteran service office. This will be an office assistant. Uh, veteran Services has seen a significant increase in traffic uh, for new veterans coming in filing claims and they've indicated that an office assistant person would be beneficial. And we've also had a request for a new part-time position at the Register of Deeds office uh, as they, they've been offering passports and it's been very successful and they're requesting the creation of a new part-time position at Register of Deeds to help meet those needs. Now, the, on that position, do the, I think they charge a fee for that, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, they that do. That fee, is that going to wash through? I the believe fee so. will cover yes. the cost of that, that new person? Yes. So the, the remaining new positions uh, are for the public safety aspect of county government. Uh, we've had a request for four new positions in EMS. This is for our uh, basic life, uh, the basic ambulances we do a lot of convalescent calls transporting folks between assisted living homes in the hospital or their doctor's office uh, this would create a new truck uh, that would respond to peak time convalescent and non-emergency calls and EMS has also indicated the need uh, for an, an additional mechanic they have one mechanic now and uh, he stays very busy with their fleet of uh, as you see 24 vehicles and have uh, suggested that adding a second mechanic would be uh, beneficial to the department. Oh, we've also had a request from emergency management 
to add a new emergency management planner to help uh, with the number of plan reviews. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that position, uh, the LEPC, the Local Emergency Planning Committee, has offered to pick up half the cost of that position. And then the Sheriff's Office, uh, we're uh, looking to uh, consider adding three new positions with the Sheriff's Office. These are human trafficking investigators that uh, were involved with the COPS grant that the Sheriff's Department brought before the board several meetings ago. So if that grant is uh, approved and successful, uh, the Sheriff's Department will be adding new uh, three new human trafficking positions. And that would be paid for by the grant? Uh, most of it. There was There's a share from the county, and I can't remember off the top of my head. I think head. it was 20% from what I read. I think so. I think that is correct. And it's a, a certain, it's a three-year program, and there's a share each year. So it, I believe it starts at 20 and may increase. Yeah, 50. Yes. 50 at the last one. So there is a there will be a county cost with those positions. I'm just going to continue moving along. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Commissioner uh, Sutton, Commissioner Boswell, do you have any questions at this point? Yes. In regards to employees, I would like to see in this process, this being the fifth year, 2021 being the fifth year, I would like to see a five-year uh, track of uh, growth in numbers of employees and FTE positions. This being the uh, 2021 being the fifth year. If, if your uh, request or what's been asked of you is passed. Okay. We can certainly do that. Thank you. And in, the, in that vein, too, one of the things I've mentioned before is trying to look at a five-year forward projection. Maybe take some, a look at what we think that might look like in the next five years as we need to add additional people going forward. Okay. All right, we're going to move right along. Talk a little bit about employee compensation. You know, we've heard a lot about uh, compensation for employees of late, and uh, you've heard from me talking about uh, high turnover positions, county employee insurance. You've heard from the sheriff and, and several other department heads about the difficulty in recruiting and retaining uh, retra uh, retaining folks. So, as we start putting together a budget. And I'm thinking, as I start thinking about the budget that I will bring to you as a recommended budget, and based on what we have been seeing in robust economic growth uh, for the past several years, and in particular, as you'll see, uh, this uh, 1920, I was thinking along the lines of some of these type of actions would help us recruit folks and retain folks. So I'm just going to go over these various strategies that I've been weighing uh, to try to address our high turnover and our uh, recruiting and retain, uh, retention problems. First of all, uh, if for us to continue our 2% merit plan, we instituted the merit plan, I think two years ago, for us to continue that merit plan into next fiscal year would be a, an additional $549,000. And we've also looked at our uh, service bonus we do a seven-year service bonus. Employees have to work with the county for seven years before they're eligible to uh, receive this bonus. Uh, for us to continue that program next year is a little over $700,000. One of the uh, strategies that I have considered recommended to the commissioners is dropping that down to five years. Our current average employee is about seven years of service with Alamance County government. So if we thought about dropping the service bonus down to where five-year employees would also be eligible, it's a nice benefit. It's a nice way to keep people engaged, but it would cost uh, almost $72,000 additional dollars for us to do that. We also have a need in our EMS department and in CECOM to eliminate the fluctuating work week. Fluctuating work week is a method of paying non-exempt employees uh, a reduced amount for overtime when they work. Uh, hours in a week that's over 40 because then they'll work some that are like 24. It's very confusing. It's very difficult for our employees to understand. We're one of the few remaining Central Piedmont counties that offer this position, I mean, uh, that offer fluctuating work week. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the biggest pieces of feedback we get from EMS and CECOM employees when we survey these folks about why they leave, what's something that bothers them is fluctuating work week. 
So it would be ideal to eliminate it and pay folks uh, for the overtime that they work uh, in the hourly manner that we uh, most folks do. But to do that for EMS, it's about $192,000 additional cost. And for CECOM, uh, it would be right at uh, $90,000 to implement that. And then we've also, I've looked at what would the, we've heard a lot about the difficulty in recruiting and retaining folks in our emergency service fields. Uh, we track our turnover here at county government. De Deputy one, detention one, paramedic, CECOM are always four of the top 10 turnover positions. It's tough work, demanding work, and we're also, uh, we have been in a market that uh, it was easy for folks to leave us and go to surrounding counties or cities for more money. So uh, one, of the, one of the strategies that I've considered uh, uh, that might be applicable is a $2,000 salary increase for all emergency services positions. This just gives you an idea I of what that, that would cost. I think that's a great idea. That, that would be applicable for everyone in sheriff, SRO, detention, emergency management, fire marshal, EMS, and CECOM, uh, only for the folks that are not going to benefit from the fluctuating work week if it went away. Is so, that across the board? Yes. That would be a two, that is, this is a, this gives you the idea of a cost of a $2,000 increase. This is not a bonus. This would be a salary increase for all emergency service positions. And we've also, I've looked at uh, a high turnover position plan. You know, we have, we, so we have those four positions that I mentioned in emergency services that are that turn over quite often. We also have significant turnover in our health nurses and in social services. And the health nurse positions in the health department are extremely difficult for us to recruit and retain. As you can imagine, the market for nurses is robust. They can almost pick wherever they want to go to work. We're very glad the ones that we have have chosen to work with us, but we know we compete uh, with some pretty high paying jobs. So we've looked at a plan that would raise salaries for health department nurses, uh, and that plan would cost almost $96,000 if it were to be implemented. And we've also looked at our Department of Social Services. There are, social services has at least five positions that are constantly in our high turnover groups, uh, child support agent, income case workers one and two, social work investigative agents, and social work three. It's about 134 positions. One, one strategy that uh, I've considered is uh, an annual bonus of at least $500 for each one of these positions. These positions turn over so quickly that if we were able to offer them a $500 bonus at the one year anniversary of their time with us, that would be uh, better than them trying to hang on and make a seven year uh, service bonus plan. So uh, it's at least a, a small incentive to, to, try to, to try to encourage a social service high turnover positions to stay. Yeah, little things like that make a big difference. Well, it, it would be uh, something that at least, as I say, annually, they would be able to get and hopefully it would encourage uh, these workers to stay with us. And uh, dental clinic, our dental clinic is funded, it's not funded by the general fund, it's funded by Medicaid dollars and, right. and outside monies, and they are doing extremely well. Uh, Medicaid has changed the way they pay for uh, dental services, and the dental clinic is making a significant profit. They are struggling with being able to uh, attract and, and retain dental um, assistance. That's the primary problem. So the, the dental folks have put together a salary plan for the dental clinic that would cost about $115,000 that they feel like would help uh, raise the salaries for dental assistance, but also raise some of the other salaries to keep everybody in the same line. Again, it's important to note that these funds do not come from the general fund. And this information that's on this slide does, uh, does not, it only represents costs from the general fund. So this doesn't represent landfill, for example. Uh, for landfill to uh, the cost for the service bonuses and merit, those are in the landfill's budget because it is a um, uh, uh, enterprise, enterprise fund. fund. Yes, yes. <laughs> so it's a takeaway from this slide. These are some of these strategies are already in place: the merit plan and the service bonus plan, the seven-year deal. But the others are strategies that I was working on pre-COVID, hoping to be able to implement, bring you to implement something we could do for employees that would be sustainable, stay within our existing tax levies, uh, but but address some of the really problem uh, positions that we have. Is there any questions about uh, any of this information? 
yeah, what I brought up before, there's going to, the, the sales tax is going to be way down this year, and the uh, outside agencies are going to, we're going to have to reduce that. I, I, I think you'll see that you're exactly right. In a moment, I'm going to go over a slide about the sales tax projections, and uh, we, we foresee it being uh, significantly reduced yeah. indeed. Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions about this slide? No, I'm okay. What about you, Mr. Sutton? Are you okay with the slide? Well, I'd like to ask a question. Years ago, we made it tougher. Uh, we capped it. We structured it differently. How many years? So forth and so on. But the longevity pay issue we went one way with does does your presentation if approved seem to go opposite of that or or uh i'll just leave it at that no the the service bonus plan is the modified longevity you know the county had a longevity program for many many years then phased the longevity program out and then i think the very I think the next fiscal year perhaps brought the longevity program back with the changes that you're talking about commissioner sutton where i believe it was increased to seven years and it was also tied to performance if an employee uh receives any kind of written uh, uh disciplinary notice they're no longer uh, no longer eligible for it and i believe it was capped and those dollar amounts were changed i don't remember exactly how that was done but those implementations are in, still in place today the only strategy I'm suggesting we could consider is taking the uh, the time period that you have to be with the county to be eligible for the program to five years instead of seven. The idea being, hopefully, uh, that gives folks a little more incentive to stay with us. Uh, if they can stay with us five years, especially in some of these positions like social services, if they're getting a bonus uh, annually in these high turnover positions, that's that five year doesn't seem quite so far off. Well, I would say going from seven to five is definitely a softening of, of the uh, what was uh, approved some time ago. Thank you. Yes. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, employee benefits going into fiscal year 2021. Uh, we will be uh, planning to include this fiscal, for next fiscal year the, the new detention officer Social Security bridge allowance. I'm, commissioners, I'm on slide number eight. Uh, we're estimating a little over $45,000 for that program. And then uh, our 401k match, uh, we do intend to uh, uh, consider you continuing to budget for the 401k match that we currently do. We're required to do 5% for law enforcement and for other employees, we offer to match up to 2% and that cost is estimated to be $950,000, a little more than $950,000. We have a number of employees that Can we uh, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. You know, uh, at one time we made, I know I, this is what I did. I made a motion and it had passed that if the county employees don't pay 2%, they don't get anything. Yes. Sir. Is that still a, a law of, or a fact? Yes, sir. Uh, the employee. So the I would encourage, and I think y'all should encourage everybody to at least put in two percent okay. it matches and it increases in years 30 years and you got a lot of money yes sir it, it that that's uh that's the way the program works today uh county employees can put two percent of their salary in the county will match that two percent but it is a for a, in the long term that is an excellent uh, an excellent thing for employees to do and we have a number of them that take advantage of it and that's that is why that's good that's good and it's the only investment you can get a hundred percent return on in that's, the first right. Year. Yes. that's right absolutely um, we're, we're having a number of employees that are going to that have retired and will be going on to our retiree health uh, insurance that cost is projected to be a little over three hundred and thirty five thousand dollars we are uh, planning or looking at increasing our dental contribution, our employee dental contribution increase by $57,000. And then the state uh, has required cities and counties to plan to contribute more money to state retirement fund. Law enforcement will get a, uh, will have to increase their contribution by 1.2% and all other employees uh, by 1.2% too. So that retirement increase is another 
almost $550,000 that the county will need to be putting into the state retirement system. I'm going to move on to slide number nine with, if I don't hear any questions. So we'll talk a little about county government equipment requests. We have a total of $94,500 in equipment requests from various county departments. Our EMS department is asking for a new piece of equipment that will uh, recharge and recover air conditioning. Uh, it's not Freon anymore. I can't think of the term of what it is, but it's a different yeah. chemical. Uh, so they've asked for funding to purchase that. Uh, our uh, emergency management department is requesting $10,000 to put mobile radios in their vehicles. The health department is requesting $23,000 for prenatal heart rate monitors. Tax department, $25,000 for check scanning equipment. Maintenance, $20,000 for security systems. And the parks department requested $10,000 for fitness equipment. May I ask a question? Yes, sir. Thank you. I have noticed vans, small, not the big box ambulances, but vans, uh, medical vans. And I know that years ago we took a look at that, or because uh, I've seen them down at Duke all the time. And I don't remember when we went to some of those. And uh, can you explain the? Um, uh, tell, tell me when that took place, how many of those bands do we have versus, you know, the big box purchases and so forth, and, and when did we start going to some of those smaller units? I'm, I'm, I don't believe I can answer that question. I'll have to get with Ray, which I'm happy to do, and ask him to provide that answer for me, and I'll get it to each commissioner. I know that uh, the units that are smaller that I'm, I'm familiar with are those convalescent transport units the ones that are used primarily to move uh, patients between group, group homes or assisted living in the hospital or doctor's appointments. So I'll have to check on the, uh, the van. I know EMS currently uses medic trucks, which are the quick response vehicles that are just like, you know, pickup trucks. Uh, they, they are usually first to the scene out in the rural county. Then they have the smaller ambulances. They're bigger than a van, but not as large as the emergency units. The emergency units are pretty good size, four wheel drive, uh, with a big box on the back that can provide all kinds of services. I, I'll ask about the vans, Commissioner Sutton, and get that answer to you. If you would, and one more question in regards to uh, the pa uh, patient transfer. Have you ever had any commentary from any of the, uh, like Hallfields or Twin Lakes or wherever, uh, where they say, uh, privately, we would rather go with a private uh, transfer company versus the county, uh, but you don't hear them say it publicly. Have you ever heard anybody say that to you? I, I've never had a, like an assisted living home talk to me about uh, the possibility of privatizing the um, uh, convalescent transport. We do have issues with convalescent transport when it comes to their discharge from the hospital. You know, uh, it, We've been working with Cone, Ray has, and Dr. Quale, our medical director, have been working with Cone to try to come up with a better system where they're not all discharged at one time. Because if you have 30 people getting out of the hospital <laughs> same day, same time, and you call CECOM at four o'clock in the afternoon and say, we got 30 folks, please come get them. It's impossible. Uh, it overloads our EMS system. So I, I, haven't, I haven't had anyone talk to me specifically about the privatization piece. I've had discussions with Ray about is that a uh, is that a possibility for us to consider, especially for some of these peak time uses. I think some of the rev we would have to figure out what we would do about the revenue that we lose. I, I'm going to quote this number, and I might be wrong, but I think maybe two million dollars of our revenue from EMS is coming from the convalescent transport. So on one hand, there is some value in considering that. The other hand is we have to figure out how to what would we do about those dollars. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, before you go for it, uh, Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions about slide number nine? No, I'm just hanging on here. Okay, <laughs> just check me in. This is a lot of information to cover, commissioners, and I, I know we've, we've been here for a while. I appreciate your patience, and I'll, I'm try, I'll try to cover it thoroughly, but uh, I know that can be, that can be 
tough sometimes to listen to me talk about this. But uh, so for vehicle requests, we do have a number of vehicle requests for county government. Our EMS service uh, speak of is asking for $640,000 worth of new vehicles and replacements, one new ambulance, uh, a replacement ambulance, two remounts, and a replacement medic unit. Lots of, lots of needs at EMS for vehicles. The detention center is requesting uh, a, a transport van to replace one that they currently have. Sheriff's Department is uh, requesting 12 replacement patrol vehicles. You know, this is one of the uh, recurring items in our budget, in our annual budgets, replacing patrol vehicles for the Sheriff's Department. The tax Department is asking uh, to be able to replace two of their vehicles, as is the Inspections Department. Maintenance is asking for one uh, F-250 sign truck. They, you know, if you didn't know, county maintenance does all the street sign installation and repair out in the rural county outside the city limits. So they do have a truck for that, but have indicated they uh, need a new uh, replacement truck. Our parks department's asking for one replacement F-250 truck and another replacement vehicle, just a car, sedan type vehicle. And then social services is also asking for two, two vehicles, new vehicles to replace two old ones that they have. And the total vehicle requests that we have received for, uh, for fiscal year 2021 is a little over $1.3 million. <laughs> May I ask another question? Yes, sir. And I mean this in a positive note, believe it or not. Uh, are we not in a system of uh, doing so many cars per year with the sheriff in certain cycle in a cycle to where we can keep them uh, fresher than in the past? Yes, we, we've been replacing 12 to 13 vehicles with the sheriff's department for I'm not sure how many years now. But it's been a number of years, about five years. Like the sheriff has indicated so that. I'm sure the sheriff can speak to that has helped keep quality, safer vehicles on the roads. I expect his folks put a lot of miles on cars every year. We put an average of over a million eight hundred thousand on our vehicles every year. What's, so the, it, what's the average age of the patrol vehicles now? They, they most of them. And I say most of them. Uh, you're looking at probably a three-year life at the, at the most out of any vehicle. So that's 36 in three years. Yeah, those things stay on the, on the road all day long. Mm -hmm. They do, and I think it's been it's been beneficial that we've been able to afford to keep uh, have a replacement plan for patrol vehicles and for EMS equipment. Uh, those ambulances get similar mileage. Uh, I don't want to quote the mileage there, but I know it's extremely high. So, you know, we've tried to we've tried to craft a capital plan that definitely takes care of patrol vehicles and ambulances related question do we broker out all of our maintenance to independent sources uh, versus doing it in-house and uh, if we don't let me just say if we don't I should know Davidson County if I'm not mistaken years ago we were going to go down and look at their garage they actually I think then had their own garage for their own cars and uh, can you comment on that uh, yes sir we for years the county's maintenance was done with the city of Graham and then uh, a number of years ago the city of Graham and the county came to an agreement to no longer use the city I think uh, they I don't remember the reasoning now but there was there were valid reasons for that we uh, bid out the county's uh, vehicle maintenance currently Wilson tire uh, is the providers the service provider they were their prices just couldn't be beat I think they I think we've renewed the contract with them at least once they've been consistently the lowest bidder for our work and folks have been satisfied with them so I think uh, we do take advantage of some dealerships if it's a uh, warranty work or something that needs to go back to a dealership is a rather new vehicle and the only mechanics in-house that we have are EMS and my discussions with Ray have been that those those vehicles are so complicated, the systems on them, that uh, they do they do ship out some of it if it's like drivetrain or something that Ken can't handle. But the majority of the work done on the ambulances is, is so specific to the ambulance, uh, they feel like having their own in-house person is the most efficient. But So we currently outsource probably 90% of our county fleet repair. I would like to request that you check with Davidson and look at their garage if it's still in existence process their budget i.e 
dollars that come in and out there, if you don't mind. Certainly. That's a great idea to, to let him do that. If we could have saved some money. Well, I'll be happy to do that. Um, Mr. Hager, before you go on to the next slide, I have a question for um, Mr. Albright. So normally we take a recess at about an hour and a half into a meeting, which we're at that point, having commissioners on the phone, and it would be complex to have a recess in the way that we have our meeting set up today. My question is, once we have a quorum and start a meeting, if a commissioner gets up to leave, does that mean that the quorum is left? In this room, yes. It would? Okay. I just wanted to check. Well, if um, you gentlemen feel like you need a recess, then okay. we'll, we'll do it if we got to do it. But I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Please come Absolutely. Ahead. Yes, they getting close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just commissioner, just stop me if, uh, if that becomes uh, uh, necessary, and I'll be happy to stop where I'm at. I'm going to slide number 11 now, and uh, these are requests from departments for capital improvements. Uh, we've had a request from IT to replace wiring and audio equipment up at this door courthouse. We've got a couple of trials and court proceedings up there and are having some difficulty with the audio video video equipment that's in place. We put that in, I think back when the courthouse was renovated, 9, 10 time frame, so it's about end of life for that. Our maintenance department uh, has received requests from various county departments to do repair and improvement projects uh, for uh, that total, 97, a little over $97,000. Our parks department is requesting $29,000 to replace a scoreboard at EM Holt ball fields and to install uh, replacement disc golf tee pads down at Cedar Rock Park. And the sheriff's department uh, has requested $108,000 worth of computers and cameras and other associated equipment. I believe this has to do with the vehicles. And so the total the total request for cap other improvements is $254,610. Fine. Can I stop you right there, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, the thing at the court, including the courthouse, like a big upgrade to do it. I th I, this this are you still there, Commissioner Boswell? Yes. I'm sorry, I, you faded out a little bit. I think you were asking about. Uh, did you were you asking if this was similar to the project that we had planned to to get the historic courthouse to a point where you could have commissioner meetings there? Was that your question? That was. So this is a different project. Uh, we, we, that, I, I don't remember the dollar amount that that project cost to, to, to get it fixed up where the commissioners could meet up there regularly, but this one is strictly to replace the existing AV equipment up there that the court uses for trials. So it's really just replacing some court equipment that's about to go out. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. It does. I was just curious if we could look at what we were thinking of doing and could this be integrated? I think, I don't know if it would, uh, I'm looking at Bruce, he's nodding at me, that it might play a role eventually in if we ever is did. Is that an up and down nod? Yes. Is that an up and down? Okay, I didn't hear his head. But. I was getting an up and down nod from Bruce about what. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I mean, to, to do, you know, when they did design the, the courthouse, they put a lot of things in place to wire it. Matter of fact, when we upgraded this room, we made sure that this could be utilized down there if we needed to try to build flexibility in the whole thing. So that price was around 45000 to upfit to current standards. Like right now, we're literally down there. Sound system is analog and not digital. You think about 10 years in the technology, how much that's changed. Um, and then this is kind of a band-aid because the system that's down there now, we have a new projector, but the connections to all that kind of stuff, everybody's laptops have different connections now, so they either have to use an adapter, which reduces the video concepts of it, and um, again, we got some price quotes and stuff like that. So this is 20,000 is a band-aid, the 45 would be upfit, but again, as soon as you put the upfit in, if, if you'd have to make that to sit, you know, 
As soon as you put something in, it starts the end of life of that. So you'd want to put it in at the time it was appropriate. So it is what it is. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I'm on uh, slide number 12 now, commissioners. So all the equipment, vehicles, and capital improvement requests total to $1,714,791. And if you remember last year, uh, we allocated 0.96 cents specifically for county capital, right? And I told the commissioners that if we did that, I would try to continue to have a capital program for county government that lived within that 0.96 cents. So that means uh, if we hold to that, which I would like to try to do, uh, we have a little over a million dollars. That's $1,047,150. So somewhere in all those requests of capital, uh, at the least, we will need to cut $667,641 to stay within our capital planning from last year. So I, hope that, I hope that makes sense. I'm going to move on to slide number 13. The county does has its, have its own capital improvement plan. We've been spending uh, $250,000 a year for the past numerous years, eight or nine years, on various projects around county government. Uh, it, it, we would like to be able to do that again next year, 2021. Three projects have been identified. The uh, roof at Environmental Health needs to be replaced, a little over $44,000 and then two projects in county office building that have to do with HVAC controls. Uh, for, for the third floor, $125,000 is the estimate, and for the first floor, 80, a little over $80,000. These projects all total out around $250,000. So these would be, barring any other catastrophe happen next year, that something breaks that's more important than these things, this would be our capital plan for next year. I'm gonna move on to slide number 14. Uh, information from the landfill. Uh, the landfill is an enterprise fund and they do have capital needs for, for next fiscal year. And their capital uh, need request is a little over $1.2 million. They have various equipment and vehicles that they plan to buy uh, that total $644,000. You can see the list of them there. They're also uh, desiring to install a pole shed the store equipment under that would cost $25,000. And then uh, we're, we're on the verge of closing the sale that they're working in now and preparing to open a new sale. Uh, it's all at, all at Austin Quarter, all in the plan for the landfill. It's just you only permit certain areas at a time. Well, we're, we're right at the verge of, of filling up the sale that we're working in now and we need to start uh, permitting the, the new sale that will open soon and that uh, has been estimated to be $550,000 plus. There's a little bit of money in there for some paving projects. As I think the sheriff can attest, as he's been down the landfill numerous times over the past week, uh, they get a lot of traffic and hard on their road, so they want to do a couple paving projects. Are you starting, still turning outside county site out before you don't let them come in? We turn them away. Good, good, good. And if they come in with no talk, we give them a warning ticket, same time we give them a regular ticket. Good. Appreciate the sheriff sending, sending some folks down to help. Landfill's just been uh, just swamped with, with uh, citizens coming down uh, during this COVID. We'll talk just a moment on slide 15 about debt service. Uh, our outstanding principal as of July 1 will be $40.6 million. So the top, the top piece of this chart is existing debt that the county holds. We have debt for Alamance County government, which uh, four and a half million of, uh, is the total debt for county government. That is all installment loans. That's gone up a little bit from last year because we did the voting machines and we also did the Seacom uh, uh, project, the VHF uh, tower project. So you can also see that we have uh, some bond debt that exists for ABSS and the community college as well as some installment uh, debt for the school system. So um, our total outstanding principal $40.6 million and our payment for fiscal year 2021, our total debt payment, uh, you can see there in the, in the furthest right column at the bottom, $8,294,834 is what we project to have to pay for existing debt for county government, schools, and the college. Then the second part of the chart 
potential new debt. These are projects that are, uh, most of these are funded, they're all funded in the county's capital plan. So for county government, if you'll recall, uh, we had talked about having a $5 million project list. The commissioners have uh, voted to give us a reimbursement resolution. We have moved on some of these projects and I'll talk more about these projects when I do the county manager's report. We also talked to the commissioners at the last meeting or the meeting before about the possibility of uh, a new EMS facility in the Mebane area. That's a possibility that could be done next fiscal year according to the county uh, capital plan. And we've also been working with the county rescue department about financing a new uh, crash truck for rescue that's been estimated to be about a million dollars. So if, if the county did all those projects, it would add an additional eight million dollars to our installment debt and our payment would be $645,833. Again, this is accommodated for in the proposed uh, capital plan. Then for the school system, we were uh, our current capital plan was looking at $96 million being borrowed in uh, fiscal year 2021 for the new high school and for Southern High School. And you can see the debt payments a little over 2.1 million. And then the community college is not planning to issue any debt for any of their bond projects in fiscal year 2021. So uh, if we, if the county, we, we have our existing debt, we have to make those payments. If the county proceeded with these potential new debt, the, the total debt service budget, the total payment would be $11,107,417. Our legal debt margin per our audit is a little over $1.1 billion dollars that's a tremendous amount of debt we could have considering we're currently at 40.6 million and the commissioners back when we were uh, going through preparing ourselves for issuing bond debt for schools in the college the commissioners voted to set a debt policy that limited the county's uh, amount of debt to three percent of our assessed tax value tax base and that uh, amount is 457 million dollars so you can see with the the outstanding principal as of July 1, 40.6 million, nowhere near the uh, bond board approved debt policy. Uh, and even if you added the total debt uh, that we could take on with the bonds and installment, we would still be under that, that dollar figure. A couple of quick questions. Yes. Um, I heard last week that Guilford County is now in the process of looking at a uh, law enforcement training center um i didn't know if we'd done any if we'd heard anything about that or not i, I, I have not but uh i had noted to reach out to the guilford county manager and talk with him about what their plans were and maybe where they were locating that so i'm not i'm not familiar with that project i don't know if the sheriff is Absolutely not. I haven't heard of that. but we'll we'll reach out to okay. marty yeah, lawn i didn't there. know we cut that in properly mm -hmm. Right, and the other one is, I was curious to see, are we getting better communications in the northern part of the county now? That project is not installed. We are negotiating with the tower company. Uh, so the tower company has been uh, working closely with Mr. Albright to try to come up with a contract that everybody can live with. We resolved that last Thursday. So Next we did. The, okay, good. Contract to us. We have the equipment to install. We've just been waiting on uh, them to agree to our terms, which Apparently they did. Thank you for that very much. So from my we'll, home home computer, my home office. Thanks to Bruce. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. Yes, sir. Thank you, Bruce. Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions about slide fifteen? No, not at the present time. Mr. Sutton, do you have any questions about slide fifteen? No, but I'll tell you this, if we're going to the very end, I won't be with you by phone. I charged it before I got on line and I had 96% and it's hanging in, but I would ask you to try to be as succinct and exact as possible, but as quick as possible. Because I don't want to miss the end of this. Yes, sir. And um, that's the complication of this process is figuring out these these uh, wrinkles along the way. We want to be sure that we get everything in, but you're right, we got other other problems too. So thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, currently on slide number 16. This is school systems information and you each have a copy of their uh, budget request. But just to summarize it, in 1920, this fiscal year, 
the school system received $42.4 million and uh, were funded at a $3.3 million level for their capital needs from our capital plan. So for fiscal year 2021, the school system has asked for a $3.3 million increase to operations, taking them to $45.7 million in their request. And they, are, uh, they have left their request for their capital funding at 3.3 million. So I believe the school system, you can look at their, you can look at their document, see I believe their continuation budget that they, they call a continuation budget is 1.8 million and uh, their, their ideal is 3.3 million. And I'll move on to slide number 17 too. So this is the community college. Again, for this fiscal year, the college has been funded at $3.4 million and received $870,000 for their capital needs from our plan. The college has asked for $3.6 million for next fiscal year. They're, they have a, uh, they have a uh, plan of operations that includes them asking for 5% each year increase. So that increase is $164,973. And the college has also asked for $480,000 in capital funding, which is $150,000 over the capital plan amount. So in the, our current existing capital plan, uh, they are budgeted for $330,000 for next fiscal year. And again, the commissioners have a copy of their uh, request in digitally and hard copy. I'm going to I'm going to keep on going in the interest of time, but of course, if anyone has a question, I'm happy to try to answer. This is our outside agency requests. The total dollar amount, uh, 3.7 million dollars. That's almost 450 thousand dollars more than last fiscal year. It's sometimes difficult to really sort through what's going on with outside agencies, but we have a number. Of, we have six outside agencies that receive home care community block grant funding. Uh, a little over a million dollars of that is just passed through monies that come from the fed, feds and the state that come to the county and we pass it through uh, $234,426 is county money that these uh, six groups have requested you can see down on the bottom left hand piece of this slide the uh, the list of agencies that are in this home care group that would be ACTA they've requested 18400 for this grant match Community Services, Meals on Wheels, In-Home Aid, and Friendship Adult Day. They are a part of this group of six, but they do not ask for any county dollars in match. And then Alamance Elder Care has asked for $88,000 in county match. So we have the six uh, community block grant folks. Then we have JCPC, Juvenile Crime Prevention. Their money is strictly passed through. They are not requesting any county dollars. We have five groups that are in the occupancy tax group. That's uh, the Arts Council, the Historic Museum, the Textile Heritage Museum, African American Cultural and Historic Center, and the TDA. They had their request total a little over $1 million, but no county funds. These are all occupancy tax pass-through dollars. We also have ACTA that, requests, that has transportation grants that run through the county uh, that are not part of the community block grant funding. So uh, they are asking for $275,594 in county monies to match uh, their grants. So ACTA's total request of county dollars is $293,994. And then the final request to outside agencies is uh, listed there on the bottom right. That's the rescue squad for $100,000. Family Abuse Services, 65,000. Link Transit, 25,000. The Airport, 262,321. And Burlington Development Corporation, which is a new applicant for uh, fiscal year 2021. They asked for a little over $31,000. It's now what do they do? Burlington Development Corporation, I don't know if uh, Andrew or Susan, you remember what they do off the top of my head, I can't remember. They're running a um, program for volunteers, senior volunteers, who are uh, serving as lunch buddies for the school system. The Title I schools and the school system have a lunch buddy program where they are mentoring the students during lunch, and they're asking for funding so that they can uh, pay mileage for their volunteers to attend. 
we have we have had requests over the past couple of years from new outside agencies, but we have not funded any. I new. thought they got that from the federal government. It's it's possible that they do. I know we've uh, we've really we have not opened up funding to outside agencies, but we take their if they send a request, we will receive it and make the commissioners aware of it. But uh, in past years, we've had four or five and and not funded any new ones. Well, I've been I've been in, informed too that uh, Link Transit is trying to hold on to a disproportional share of the funding from the from that one of those grants that's going to have a negative impact on ACTA and so uh, ACTA is concerned about being able to pay their rent since they won't be able to get that money I don't know if you've heard any more about that than I have Amy recently but uh, I spoke with uh, city manager Harden Watkins and Mike Nunn and some of his the staff in uh, Burlington last week and I, I'm understanding and hopeful that ACTA is still possible to get funding from this uh, uh, these funds that come from DOT to right. the MPO it's not been completely ruled out yet you know ACTA is asking for I believe it was 40 forty thousand dollars additional money for their lease and uh, it, so my hope is that they'll be able to receive that funding from the dollars that the MPO Certainly. gets. And uh, also, uh, city manager told me and Mike mentioned that they also believe there's stimulus money that may be applicable to this that are coming from the feds, I guess, because of the COVID crisis for economic stimulus. Uh, and it's possible that active lease payments might be able to be met through that. So I made the city aware that commissioners and the county management is concerned you know about ACTA not being able to access some of these funds and uh, the bottom line that I took away was it's still possible that they could so we'll we'll continue to work with the city in hopes that uh, ACTA will be able to be able to be funded. Brian speaking on that any extraordinary expenses that the county might be enduring right now by having extra employees uh, i really don't know where, where that, what else is involved with this but are we tracking those numbers to make sure if fema does allocate some money that we get our proportion of it yes sir uh debbie hatfield and emergency management has been working with fema already and sat in on their uh webinars to prepare the county for filing for reimbursement so i know that she's reached out to various departments to, to get that process started although we haven't spent a tremendous uh, bruce did you have a comment on that too well yeah it started since uh march 15th she sent out the forms just like we did uh for reimbursement during the hurricane so we're filling out um the forms and also putting in, in into uh chronos mm -hmm. and when they do an audit they match up so I know many departments are participating in that, and we all are trying to take advantage of every opportunity to get some, some funding back, knowing how difficult next year may be. Commissioner Boswell, were you, were you able to hear that? Yes, I heard most of that. That's good. We just need to keep track, track of that. that. That's right. Yes, sir. I'm going to move on to slide number 19. We're, we're the, so that completes the, the request piece of uh, county government, our uh, education uh, groups, outside agencies. It's just a very brief overview. I'll make sure that you have access to the request from outside agencies. And then, of course, you've got the more detailed uh, request data in the snapshots and from the two uh, school system and the college. So I want to talk a little bit now about revenue uh, projections and revenue discussion. We're going to talk about uh, what we are seeing with our property tax base as well as pre-COVID projections and then what COVID, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic has possibly done. It's just so early. It's a very difficult conversation to have because we're just not 100% sure what this has done to uh, our economy, to, to revenues. Um, so it, it, we're going to tell you kind of what we think might be applicable and then we'll talk just briefly about fund balance and, and uh, where we're at with how we've used it too so i'm going to jump right into this again if you have questions just just stop me so as of march 5th uh tax department provided us with an assessed value that we are working off of to use for next fiscal year for 2021 we'll try to refine this some more before we do the manager's recommended budget 
but right now we're using a, a, the March 5th assessed value and the assessed value as of March 5th was a little over $15.2 billion of tax base in Alamance County. That is a $536 million growth in our, in our base valuation, which is about 3.6%. That's, that's great. That's very good news. That is growth. That's not us changing their values. That is new development, new industrial, commercial, and residential growth uh, taking place uh, across the county. That's good news. Our collection rate uh, that we would be using for 2021 comes to us from 1819, and that's 98.84%. And our motor vehicle collection rate uh, is 100%. And so for based on the March 5th assessed value, which we will continue to refine uh, up until manager's recommended budget, uh, one penny on the tax rate is $1,508,831. This is good news. This has been the trend that we've seen over the past several years here in Alamance County. Robust tax base growth uh, based on folks uh, building and expanding businesses and building homes. Good. This is good. So slide number 21. So these are pre-COVID 19 revenue sources. This is this is looking at what, what, what did we think was happening to property tax and sales tax? Those are our two big revenue sources for county government. So for based on uh, the information that we're seeing about property taxes, we estimate that we uh, would have a little over $101 million in a total levy of property taxes next fiscal year. That's a $4.2 million increase over the 1920 budget. And so right now, as of the end of March, March 31st, the county had collected $93.2 million in total property taxes. Uh, and that is compared to the budget for this fiscal year of 96.8. So we're, we're really getting close to collecting all of the property tax for fiscal year 1920 that we had budgeted. Again, good news, property tax growing, the revenue continuing to come in based on base growth. Sales tax pre-COVID, this is this information on this slide is based on the trends we were seeing before uh, this pandemic has started to kick into our economy. We were estimating uh, $32.9 million for next fiscal year in sales tax. That was looking to be a $1.1 million increase in revenue from sales tax for, for the county over the 1920 budget. And so just to give you a point in time of where we are right now with sales tax, as of the end of March, we had collected $19.4 million for seven months. It's important to understand that uh, sales tax is always two months in arrears. So we had, up through the end of January, we had collected 19.4 out of a budget of $31.7 million for this fiscal year. So pre-COVID, <coughs> revenues from our two largest revenue sources look pretty good, right? Sales tax, excuse me, property tax base is growing. We're, we look like we were gonna receive uh, more dollars from uh, property tax revenue, sales tax revenue. Every sign is, was pointing to the trends continuing to go up, robust economy, people are buying, and we were looking at uh, a little over a million dollars in new revenue, all good news. Again, remember, these are pre-COVID numbers. To talk about unassigned fund balance, uh, our, our last audit for fiscal year 1819, we had $18.3 million in unassigned fund balance. Percentage of expenditures is 12% per the audit. Our goal uh, is to have that at 17%, so we'd love to see our unassigned fund balance get back up to 17%. That's the board approved percentage goal. And if you can look at this chart and see how unassigned fund balance has been budgeted since fiscal year 1415, that's been used to balance the budget. So we've, we've gone from $3.7 million in 1415 uh, up to at a high $6.6 .6 million in 1718. And we started a downward use of fund balance. And one of my goals as manager has been to try to wean ourselves off of using fund balance. It's, there is some appropriate use of unassigned fund balance to balance the budget. I've just always felt like five to six million dollars was a little bit too much is a little we don't want to spend this this is our savings that's free and clear we can use for many purposes we really don't want to spend it we haven't been spending it but 
we don't want to spend. So I've been trying to work to reduce it. If you remember last fiscal year, the school system kept a flat budget request. So we reduced the use of fund balance by $1.5 million. We didn't spend that money somewhere else. We said, let's, let's pull back on our savings that we've used to balance the budget. I'm glad we did now, because as we get into the, the times that we're in. So I'm gonna move on to slide number 23. To get, this gives you an idea of the requests that we just went over, all the general fund requests, the departments, the education, outside agencies, and how it was gonna stack up to pre-COVID revenues. So if you'll remember, when we started talking, the total general fund requests for next fiscal year, a little over $181 million. That's the request, that's how much money's been asked for. So if you, pre-COVID revenues, the total estimated revenue for pre-COVID numbers is $173.3 million. So that top group under revenues, there's an $8.3 million gap between what's been asked for by departments and schools and what we think we would have had pre-COVID and without using any fund balance at all. No fund balance to budget. So that's, that's revenues only. We were $8.3 million off from our requests, pre-COVID revenues, and it would have taken five and a half cents increase property tax to balance the budget if we did no reduction to uh, the request at that, with those revenues. If you included the fund balance that we budgeted in 1920, you know, my goal has been reduce that, but let's just, my, for discussion's sake, I'm saying if you left fund balance budgeted just the way it has always, it was budgeted this year, you're at a $2.9 million gap. The revenue goes, the revenue and resources goes to 178.8 million. That's still not 181.7. You're still at a almost $3 million gap. You would have, you could raise taxes 1.92 cents to balance that or cut the request. I'd like for the commissioners to, to, to see that number because pre-COVID, these revenues were good. Property tax revenue was good. Sales tax revenue was good. We would have uh, liked to have reduced fund balance a little bit, but to only be $3 million off from requests to revenues is pretty good. That, that's revenues coming in strong and county departments doing a good job trying to keep their requests reasonable and planning over the past couple of years to try to put us in a place where our budgets are sustainable. That's been one of our goals is to get into a budget model where growth can carry us through. If the commissioners can live with the current tax rate, we can live within the new revenue that it creates, education, county, outside agencies. This budget year was very close pre-COVID to making that happen, okay? so. I want to talk slide 24 about what we are seeing and how revenue what we have seen in the past for revenue trends when we if we're entering a recession so the last recession was 2008 9 time frame that's really the only benchmark we have to look and see what might happen is this COVID pandemic temporary is it a window or is it a recession and the question for for county staff for for me is how do you plan for it so uh, obviously revenue becomes very volatile once you start entering uh, into the times that we're in. From a property tax perspective, back in the last recession, it was a very slow impact. It was delayed. The first year of the recession, 2008, property tax did not take a hit. It did very well. It really didn't get hit until the second year, and the reason it got hit, part of the reason, was uh, you had a lowered collection rate. You can see that our collection rate in the last recession went down a half a percent between 08 and 09. You know, people were having a harder time paying their bills, paying their property taxes, it was more difficult to collect. So it wasn't the first year of recession, it was the second year. Sales tax, immediate impact, right? We, we, in uh, 2008, 2007, 2008 to 2008, 2009, we, have, uh, we saw a 23% decrease in sales tax revenue uh, in Article 39. That's the article that's just for the county. That's sales tax revenue that's just for county government to use however it wants to use it. So if that happens, if we're looking at that, if we're in a recession in today's dollars for fiscal year 2021, that's a 3.2, almost $3.3 .3 million reduction in sales tax revenue uh, going into next fiscal year. That would mean we would be planning on $3.3 million less in Article 39 revenue for next fiscal year. 
Then what we saw in the recession last time was the second year of the recession, it was another 43% decrease. So that was from eight, nine to nine, 10. Uh, and that would be another $4.7 million sales tax decrease in fiscal year 21, 22. Not, not the one coming, but the one after. So these, you know, these recessionary sales tax impacts are dramatic and they spread out over multiple years. Article 40 and 42, these are, these are sales tax revenues that the county gets that are split between the county can do whatever it wants to with it and has to be used for education capital. These, these articles decreased in the last recession also, not as dramatically as Article 39. Uh, the first year of the recession, 07, 8 to 8, 9, you saw an 8% decrease in Article 40 and 42. If, that ha if we use this plan, if we look at this model to plan sales tax revenues for next year, that's an almost $1.4 million uh, decrease in these two articles. And then the second year of the uh, recession, 08, 9 to 9, 10, we saw a 5% decrease in one of the articles and an additional 10% in the other article for a total of another $1.2 million. All this says, so a property tax, apparently may not take as a hit in the first year of a recession. Sales tax takes a hit first year, pretty significant, and it's multi-year. The second year is almost combined, almost $6 million. <coughs> yes. I don't, think, wow. I don't personally think we're gonna have that problem this time. Yes. But I think the recession is gonna be short-lived. I certainly hope so. I do so. Well, hopefully we're pumping enough money back into the economy yeah, right. to yeah. be pent up demand once people yeah. can get back out. Just the question then becomes, when can they get back out? Yeah. On slide number 25, so what you see here is what we think might would happen post-COVID next fiscal year, what happens to our revenue sources potentially. We think property tax, based on what we saw last time, may stay very sane, very good. The, the uh, collection rate is not gonna take a hit, and we believe we could still continue to see uh, growth in property tax base. Again, that was based on uh, the last recession that we entered. Sales tax, we would be looking at, if we used the information from seven, eight, eight, nine, we'd be looking at a four, almost a $4.7 million decrease in sales tax revenues. It's a 14.75% decrease. That's not that 23% because it's, Article 39, 40, and 42. So it's all of those put together. It's not quite the 23%, but it's still pretty significant. Uh, so we would we we would be looking at almost 4.7 million dollars in sales tax decrease from the current budget. That's dramatic. Uh, again, that information is there about uh, what how sales tax is looking now. So on slide 26, this is where we put it together to show you post-COVID revenues. Based on, you got your requests again, $181.7 million. This is what all the departments and schools and college have requested. Just in revenues, if we did not budget any fund balance, there would be a $15.2 million gap in our available revenues and the requests, which if you just tried to raise taxes to cover that gap, it'd be a, over a 10 cent tax increase. But if you put the fund balance that we used in 1920 in the mix, it takes it up a little bit, takes it up to, we're at a $9.8 million gap. So you, losing that $4.6, $4.7 million worth of sales tax next year, if that indeed is gonna happen, if we plan a budget indicating that that is likely to happen, it's a pretty significant hit and takes a lot of thought on how to balance a budget that incorporates that kind of impact of sales tax revenue. What does that do to our our uh, fund balance and what percentage would that take it to? Well, we are, are, we're projecting our fund balance percentage to go up this year because we're gonna, uh, we've made some moves internally to uh, cover those fronted costs for school system and ACC from capital reserves instead of fund balance. And I'll be coming to you next time with information about the, the loan for the county. That right. would reimburse free that up. That's right. So we, it's gonna go up some, we're, we're we're watching our budgets to make sure we don't spend fund balance, right? So we hope it'll go up. But budgeting this $5 million next year, we would hope we wouldn't spend it. We would hope it would balance, although it is more risky next year. You know, in a normal year, as your economy's growing, you know, we're always pretty conservative with our sales tax estimates and our property tax revenue estimates. We stay conservative. So we've always felt like, 
county departments don't ever spend exactly what they get. They, they, they don't ever spend it all, and we always make a little bit more money. It's safe to budget some fund balance. I like to put a lot of thought into budgeting fund balance next fiscal year because we just don't know about the revenues. But, um, so our hope would be we wouldn't spend it, but we would even budgeting it, we would still need to cut uh, almost $10 million uh, in, in requests, which is much more than that. What, what I tell you earlier was uh, 1.9 or something like that, very, very low. We were, we were really looking good until this, this has happened. And that's the case for every business in Alamance County, for every employer. They're all in the same place we are. And all the rest of the counties as well. Yes. And the state of North Carolina. Right. Because um, they have a, their rainy day fund. And I had talked to some of our legislators about maybe if they had a grant system in place where local governments could ask for part of the rainy day fund to make up our sales tax um, shortfalls. And apparently the state has its own sales tax shortfall issue right. that they're looking at. Probably going to have to use the whole rainy day fund for the for their own budget I think so and uh, I think it's just uh, it's hitting everybody across the board private business local government state government um, do, I don't know if any of the commissioners if Commissioner Boswell Commissioner Sutton if you have any questions I, I, I think we're almost done but this there's a lot of info on these past couple of slides I don't know if you have any questions I'm fine Bob, I, I, I got just one comment to this um, I think as the president said yesterday, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I do feel like that these projections you've made are good. We really don't even know definitely what's gonna happen, but I, this thing happened and it wasn't the economy that was bad as it was in 08. Our economy was pitiful. The banks were going broke, made us terrible loans and everything else. I think just a gut feeling on this that our sales tax is not going to really hurt i talked to a neighbor yesterday he's getting a hundred percent of his pay for three months so if people are getting the pay from the stimulus companies that are getting these loans i think we're not going to see the recession come in that we're talking about here that's just my opinion on that of course um but i think there is light at the end of this tunnel and hopefully that light will come before we actually vote on the budget i hope so too um and you know i'm gonna i think our next slide 27 speaks to what you're you you just said mr boswell we've changed we're, we're proposing to change our budget timeline uh with all that's happened with uh the pandemic uh we're looking at if we were going to have a manager's recommended budget on may the 4th and I'd like for us to consider having the recommended budget on the 18th. I think that gives me a little extra time to see if, you know, if we've, we've gotten in February sales tax, I'll tell you about that in Manders report. But I want to see a little bit more data about how things are trending this year and also give the state time to make sure they're not going to make any changes at the state level that might affect our budget. They, they know that counties and cities are all on very similar time frames. So if they're going to do anything to help us or hurt us they'll do that hopefully in the next couple of weeks uh, and that'll give me a little bit of additional time but I agree with you I, I I'm certainly hopeful and confident that you know our economy was good and uh, as you can see in those pre-COVID numbers I think a lot of planning and hard work and and uh, strategizing was just at the verge of paying off and we're, we're still close I, th I still think that the economy can come back and turn around and this not be uh, that long bleak time period like we went through in right. seven eight uh, so I want the commissioners to know we have an idea of what we would need to do if that did happen but I think it's more likely that we're going to see something that hope we will recover sooner than later so we do have the, the slide 27 is the new the new proposed calendar for the budget uh, with with an adoption with the board vote hopefully voting to adopt a budget for next fiscal year on June 15th we would bring the capital plan to the commissioners on June the 1st same evening that we have the public hearings so. and that concludes my presentation of retreat information a uh, lot of lot of lot of data in this uh, if you'll notice we have April 20th we really don't have something scheduled 
commissioners can digest this information, come back with questions, or if you, you can let me know if we want, if once we get ourselves set up where we can take public comment and we know what we're doing, then maybe we can stay within the 10 limit. If you want a specific person brought in, like uh, maybe Dr. Benson or Dr. Gatewood or anyone else, we'll arrange that and make sure we work within the 10, the 10 limit too. We might be able to switch people out. Yes. Thank you. All right, um, thank you for that. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a budget amendment with a BGAA grant with the Sheriff's Department. Um, Sheriff, are you presenting that? I am. I'm coming for you, the commissioners today, to ask permission first to apply for a $750,000 BJA grant that is going to help us on our stepping up initiative and the mental health problems in our jail. Uh, this will not require no upfront monies from the county. We will do an in-kind match with salaries of those individuals that is currently working in the stepping up initiative and the mental health uh, situation at the jail. Uh, our grant, four-year grant, with the Stepping Up Initiative actually in September 30th, 2020. If you allow us to apply for this grant and we get this grant, it will go in effect October 1st, 2020. So it's sort of a hurry up thing for us after getting information on this grant. Purpose of this grant is to reduce the recidivism uh, of those with mental health illnesses in our criminal justice system. And believe me, we, we are the biggest mental health hospital in the <laughs> county, is the Alamance County Jail. Mm -hmm. uh, no new funds will be required. All match will, like I said, will be provided with in-kind contribution with staff time and uh, supporting work. Impact Alamance has agreed to write the grant for us totally free, which is normally cost us about $4,000. I'm asking commissioners for three things today. One. Permission to apply for the Bureau of Justice a grant in the amount of $750,000. Two, approval to amend the budget to operate the grant once awarded is received through the county manager's office. And three, contingent budget approval to spend $750,000 in federal dollars if the grant is received. I'll move that we approve. Second. Okay. Um we would first be seeking a um, um, understand we need to do it in two motions first would be a motion to allow the sheriff department to apply for the three-year seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar justice and mental health grant and if awarded to budget it no earlier than july 1st 2020 per the grant ordinance so note. second okay we have a motion and a second to for that motion if there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, and then the second motion would be to adopt the grant project ordinance contingent upon being awarded the justice and mental health grant. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion uh, to approve or to adopt that ordinance and a second. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Hager, do you have uh, something in your county manager's report? Well, I was <laughs> going to talk to the commissioners about sales tax revenue, but I think I have okay. talked about it just about enough. Uh, just, just to tell the commissioners that uh, we have received the February numbers, right? So we, I told you in January, we had through January. We've received the February numbers. We're about... Uh, $200,000 to the good over last February. So, I mean, that tells us that sales tax was rolling yeah. up until February. We will continue to watch those numbers and, uh, you know, report as we go. But I think I've said enough about budget and, and revenue. So. Well, I kind of agree with what Bill said about uh, I see such a, the people I'm talking to, I see a really pent-up demand. I mean, they can't go to many retail stores. A lot of people are starting to look at buying things online. But, uh, you know, we got hopefully back to school coming up in the fall. We've got summer issues coming up once we get through this. There ought to be a, a, I think things a will real pick boom up. come I on. I think say, it'll be short-lived. I would say one thing that you will see, I mentioned this, uh, at our next meeting, I'm going to be bringing uh, 
uh, request to the board to follow through with the loan projects for the county projects that we were doing. We, we were at $5 million. Uh, I've curtailed that down to 2.2 million. That's really to just do those projects that we've already started, right? So I felt like this, these funds are all in the count, uh, county's capital plan, but the way things are, probably wise, go forward with uh, half that project just to, just to make sure everything's on, on go. So we'll be bringing that request to you at the next meeting. So. Okay. Right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, comments? Uh, Mr. Sutton or Mr. Boswell, do you have any comments you want to make? I'm fine. Amy, I just want I just want to give a shout out to Brian and his group for a great presentation. A little harder to follow right here on my little laptop, but uh, a good job with that. And also, I just want to let each and every first responder out in our community know that my prayers go out with you every morning. I, first thing I do because they're on the front line of this and uh, I just appreciate each and every person that works for our county that's helping to deal with this well amen to that um, do you gentlemen here have any com comments to make no. No. okay uh, before we adjourn um, I wanted to touch base as we're all together about our agenda for the April 20th meeting Mr. Albright, was that, are we supposed to set a public hearing at that meeting having to do with the bonds? I think the schedule has changed. Um, the schedule is flexible. If the um, board wanted to set a public hearing on April 20th, we would be shooting for the May 18th meeting. And these are for, for our loans, for the right. county government's loans. So we could do it at the April 20th meeting or the May 4th meeting, either one of those meetings to um, set the public hearing. Format 18th would be appropriate. Okay, but we can push them off if we need to. I would suggest that you delay it. Yeah, because uh, it would be hard to have a public hearing. It would. In these circumstances. So, okay, I just wanted to um, ask that while everybody was present so we would all get the same information at the same time. Okay. Um, all right, and I also want to take a minute to thank Mr. Sutton and Mr. Boswell for being willing to call in. They volunteered to do that and it really helped tremendously in be able to have the meeting today and to get our work done. So we really appreciate that. So if there's no uh, other business before the board, we'll be adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.